Yeah, warm welcome from my side as well. I'm Marion Gomper from Sources. And uh, yeah, I must say we are we feel so honored to have a Sources of Inspiration lecture here in Seville on the occasion of the European Film Awards. And uh, so we, we are very grateful for this and we thank the Spanish Creative Europe desks from Madrid, uh, San Sebastian, <coughs> Barcelona and Sevilla for hosting us here and making this event possible. And we also thank European Film Academy for their kind cooperation. And of course, finally, we thank Creative Europe Media for having supported Sources for such a long time. So Sources 2 is a training program that has been offering script development and training for prof professional filmmakers all over Europe for um, 26 years now in 30 countries and almost 170 films developed through Sources 2 have been made to date. Sources of Inspiration is a series of lectures that has been initiated in 92 and since then our printed lectures have been distributed all over the world. And now I'm very happy to introduce our Sources of Inspiration lecturer today, Lukas Dond. And Lukas, very warm welcome, it's great you are here, thank you so much. Lukas won't be only the youngest lecturer we ever had at Sources, but is also a former uh, Sources 2 participant. His popular film Girl was developed in a Sources 2 script development workshop two years ago. So you can imagine how proud we are after its premiere in Cannes. Girl won four awards in Cannes and since then took such a successful journey all over the world and won many awards and nominations. It's now the Belgian Oscar submission and now here in Seville is Girl with three nominations for the European Film Awards. So let's keep fingers crossed. I'm now very happy to pass the word to Lucas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Mm. Okay. I'm going to sit down, I think, but I'll move as close to you as I can. Um, so, hello, everyone. <coughs> First of all, I have to address the fact that I feel strange sitting on this side of the stage because I was always the one on your side. And this is the first time, actually, I am on this side. So um, it's a it's a it's a strange feeling. Um, I hope that I will say things during this hour that will inspire you. I'm not sure, um, as I feel like I am myself learning so much about what it is to make a film or what it is to be an artist. Um, but I decided to talk about who I am um, and why I did the things that I did and why I made the films that I made in the hope that there are things in there that are inspirational. Um, <coughs> First of all, um, it's important to say that I didn't always want to be a filmmaker. Um, when I was young, I wanted to be uh, a dancer. Um, when I grew up, I had this big, big passion for dance. Uh, and I gave, like, when I was in um, school, I gave small performances for my classmates. Um, I, I danced on Destiny's Child, I danced on, like, all the popular hits. Um, and I found out that it was kind of awkward for my classmates that I did that. They felt like it was not really, um, yeah, they didn't really feel comfortable with it. And I saw that. And in a way, that was the first time that I understood that a boy is supposed to behave a way and a girl is supposed to behave another way. I think it's a stereotype that is changing and that actually... I've decided with my work, I want to help change. And that has taken a big part in why I make the films that I make and um, why I also made a film like Girl. Um, but so back to me dancing on Destiny's Child when I was a kid. Um, 
because I felt that it was awkward, I stopped dancing. Um, I stopped dancing and I um, took the advice of my dad to go to the Boy Scouts. Um, and so I did that. I went to the Boy Scouts and I um, did not really enjoy that. But I did it, and I tried to fit in into the idea of a Boy Scout. Um, and so I think that there, in that moment where I tried to fit in and not do what I wanted to do, a big, big team of my work uh, developed. I didn't know that at that moment, of course. Um, but I think films are cannot be anything but very personal. And even though they're not autobiographical, there will always be elements that happen to your life or that happen to someone else in your life that will influence the films that you make. Um, at that moment, I also discovered directing people, seeing people what to do. Um, my brother, for example, I really enjoyed directing him. And um, I really enjoyed directing my mother. And I really enjoyed directing my father. Um, to great frustration of all of them, um, but still I kept on doing it. And for my communion, uh, I asked my mother if she would give me uh, a camera. And she said yes. Um, and that's the first time actually that I had a camera in my hands. Um, and that I started filming something. And I started filming my brother. And I started filming my mother, who really didn't want to be filmed. And I, I made small little films of it. I didn't edit them myself. A friend of my mom's did. Um, but I started trying to create small little narratives. And actually my mom made me look back, she kept all that, and she made me look back at that material. Um, and sometimes I myself am in the frame, and it was a very confrontational moment for me watching those clips together with my mother. Because if I look at myself in that moment, I see a very feminine um, boy and that femininity has been something that has always, when I was younger, when I was a child, that neither my mother or my father were comfortable to discuss that with me. Um, it's only much later that we started to discuss that. Um, but also that element for me growing up, me feeling like I was very feminine and like the boys around me were not like that, has become an essential theme in my work today. Uh, it's actually always been there, but with Girl, I think it's the first time that I really talk about it so concretely. Um, so back to me having the camera and filming um, my family. Um, I continued filming and I was able to start editing myself at the age of 15. Uh, and I was really into slasher movies. I was really into horror, and I was really into bodies that um, got hurt and got stabbed and got slashed. And so I bought a lot of blood, uh, and I tried to have my friends come over and make like a small um, version of what a very famous movie at that time called Scream. Um, and my fascination for horror continued to stay, and I think that it is because it's a genre, genre in which effect is very at the essence. You, for me as a filmmaker, I, the first genre that I discovered was horror because I felt like it was easy for me to have an effect while I was making horror. I could scare people or I could be, I could be very dramatic. Um, and all these things. And I think that 
now looking back on that period and looking at my work now, I think that the horror of the body is something that I still, that still lingers through my work, not in the way of a slasher, stabber, horror film, but in a completely different, maybe more realistic way. But I'll get back to that when I talk about Girl. Um, my father really wanted me to uh, study uh, math sciences in high school. He didn't really like the idea of me going to an art school. And so we had agreed that if I did that, if I studied uh, math sciences, that he would let me try film school when I was 18. Um, and so we had that agreement. And actually, in high school, um, I was in a very Catholic high school. And um, although I really enjoyed being there, my creativity and my personality had been really paused. Uh, I knew by that time what it was like to try to fit in um, by being in the Boy Scouts. And actually, in high school, I did much more of that. Um, being uh, being where I was. And then at 18, <coughs> I was allowed to start film school. And it was a big, big clash for me because all of a sudden I was in an environment with a lot of different people and a lot of different personalities, outspoken personalities, people that really knew who they were, people that knew what they wanted to talk about, and I was 18 and I didn't know any of that. I didn't really know who I was and I definitely didn't know what to talk about. And if I even had something to talk about. My entry film for film school was a slasher film in which I killed my brother. Um, luckily, they let me in to that film school because I think they felt the passion that I had for films, for cinema. Um, and at that time, it was really a sort of American Hollywood cinema. Because that's the cinema that I grew up with. That's the cinema that my family loved. That's the cinema that was proposed to me. My mom is a big Titanic fan. I think she has seen it for over 20 times. Um, and if people ask me what is the most important movie to date in my life, then I then I respond Titanic, but not, not because of the film, because of the fact that the film made me see the effect that films can have on people. When I saw my mom talk about Titanic, and she saw that film at a moment in her life where she just had divorced my dad, I saw that the film healed her in a way, because she was in need of this big love story. Um, to contradict the reality of her life at that moment, and that film gave that to her. And so, by seeing that, I discovered the power of cinema. I discovered the power of being in a room, um, shutting down from your own reality, and entering another reality for an hour and a half, two hours, two hours and a half. Um, and that idea that made me so enthusiastic that I would be or would try to be able to do that, um, that I think there for sure I knew that cinema was what I wanted to continue with. And so when they allowed me to enter film school, when they allowed me to try to be there, I was extremely happy. I was extremely happy and extremely scared because I felt like being there was going to be a very tough time for me. And so the first year started, and I was right. Because I had tried to fit in uh, for 18 years, I didn't really have an outspoken personality like the other people, and I didn't really have honest themes that I wanted to talk about. So my first year was a hot mess. Um, because my teachers confronted me with the fact that I, my films were really boring and that I, and by saying so, that I as a person was really boring. Um, 
And that was a hard confrontation. Um, and then I said to myself, I will use my films to be more honest than I am in real life or than I can be in real life. And the thing was that I, was, I am a homosexual man and I had not ever talked about my sexuality with anyone. Um, I think now, looking back, if you want to make films, you have to be extremely honest. You have to be extremely honest with yourself. You have to be extremely honest with the world around you. And I think that my films were not good at that moment because I was not. I was not honest. Um, so I decided to talk about the teams that had been very important in my life um, by my films and not by, ver by verbally talking with people, but by addressing those topics in my films. And in a way that felt safe for me because I could talk about them, but at the same time distance myself from a direct confrontation. And so a first short film existed, which is called Corps Perdu, um, and which is a short film about a young uh, ballet dancer. Um, I think what was very important for me in my education in, in my film school is that it was a school that combined um, documentary and fiction. So we never had to choose in the school between one of the two. We had to make short documentaries and we had to make short fictions. And I was always convi convinced that I wanted to make fictions. That's also why I made uh, my first short, Corps Perdu. Um, and I never was really interested in documentary. I was not interested in, I was interested in creating. I was interested in, in writing and then creating things that did not exist rather than being confronted with what existed. <coughs> um, but I had to make a, smart, uh, a short documentary because everyone needed to. And um, I decided to go to um, uh, a house where children of immigrants and sailors uh, live together while their parents are away. And I was there for three months, um, watching, um, being with the kids. I slept there. Uh, and I was filming myself. <coughs> and while I was doing that, I discovered the power of looking at something of really, really looking at something and something le letting something exist in front of your lens. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, bronchitis. <coughs> Better. Um, and I had always been trying to narrate, narrate and create and now I was, for the first time, I was really watching reality and let reality <coughs> be what the film was going to be. And actually making documentary, making that documentary learned me so much about taking the time to look the position of where as a camera and as a person and as a director I wanted to be at and the way I wanted to show something. And what it learned me most of all, because I never knew what was going to happen. I never knew what the kids were going to do. I never knew what was going to come. But it was the power of the moments. The power of something existing without you trying to control it. And I think I took that in my fiction. When I'm on set, when I direct, I have my scripts. But I'm always looking for that moment in which there will be something that I cannot control. And actually my whole fiction set is based on that idea. The whole technical team, me, myself as a director, we take as less place as possible. 
the people that take the most place on my set are the actors. We never use a lot of lighting. We never, the decor is always, always ready. The apartment is always able to go wherever you want. And so the people that take the biggest position on my set are the actors. And that is something that I learned through shooting documentary. Um, still, after shooting that do documentary, I was even more convinced that I wanted to do fiction. Because what was hard on me shooting a documentary was I felt that even though I learned a lot about that position, I found it difficult to be somewhere and then have to leave and taking something with me. I felt there was a brutality to that that was very difficult for me to handle. And that in that short period of time, I didn't really know how I, as a person, dealt with that. With the addicts of filming someone and me myself editing the narrative on someone that exists. Um, so I continued with fiction. And I made another fictional short film called L'Infini, uh, Infinity, um, which was my master's film, and which is a film about a young boy whose father returns from prison and who is confronted with, for the first time, the figure of a father, the figure of a masculine energy. And well, when I was writing that uh, film, it came very naturally, but I didn't really know why that was a film that was coming out of me. Um, and at the time I had um, a teacher that um, taught music and film, and actually she had become really a little bit my personal mentor. Um, and she was really the one that for the first time confronted me with the teams that I work with, the teams that are in my work. Because now I'm able to speak about them and able to go back in my, let, let's say, timeline to know where they're from. But at that time, I really didn't know why I was doing the things that I did, why I was showing the things that I showed. And L'Infini is a film that is a struggle between masculinity and femininity in a very concrete way, a struggle between a father and a mother and a young boy in between, but in a much abstracter way, it is a struggle between a masculine energy and a feminine energy. And that is something that had been very important for me as a child, for me as a teenager, and at that po moment, moment in my life for me as a filmmaker. Um, and so, Finding out those central themes like um, gender uh, or behavior um, were very important for the continuation then after school. I have to um, say that for me as a filmmaker, the first time, because I grew up with American cinema, the first time I was confronted with the possibilities of a camera or the possibilities of the medium of cinema were by Elephant by Gus Van Sant. I watched that film in the first year of film school and it's through seeing Elephant that I found out that a camera and a way of using that camera narrates just as much as the script of a film or as the actors of a film. Um, I really saw how the position of a camera, the way we follow the character, the way we looked at something, defined how we interpreted it. Um, and also the fact of timing, which is so crucial. The script of Gus Van, the script of Elephant is like 16 pages or something, 15 pages. And still it is a 90-minute film. And the timing of that film is so spectacular. I watched that film, I think, twice. I watched that film a lot of times because I was, I was shocked with the f other possibilities next to what I had seen as American cinema. Explosions, 
ships that sunk, all these things. And through um, Gus van Sant, I discovered an, an other Belgian artist that became extremely important to me, which is called Chantal Ackermann. Um, and Jean Dieleman, I don't know who saw Jean Dieleman. Did any one of you see Jean Dieleman? No? Okay, you should all watch Jean Dieleman. She's gonna rock your world. Um, <coughs> Chantal Ackermann left us, unfortunately. But Jean Dieleman is an amazing work of art about a widowed woman in the 70s that we follow to her daily routine. Um, and, and the loneliness of that, the cage of that. Um, and I think that there's a lot of Chantal Ackermann in Girl. I think there's a lot of Jean Dielman in Girl. Uh, and I actually had one person describe the comparison as the fact that in Jean Dielman, um, Chantal really um, tries to show those invisible cages of a widowed woman in the 70s by the repetition of the daily routine in her house. And in Girl, I think we try to show those cages for a young trans person by constantly repeating the repetition of uh, the ballet scenes. Someone that is in a very binary world, in the ballet world, a very gender-specified world, is constantly fighting, working, dancing to fit into that world. Um, yeah. So Chantal Ackermann became very important to me. Um, and next to that, I started watching another very, Bel very famous Belgian pair of filmmakers um, called uh, The Brothers Dardenne. Have, has anyone seen films from the Brothers that then? Yes, okay. Um, and when I was reading about the films of the Brothers that then, they released a book, very interesting book about their work. I saw that they were using choreography uh, as a way to uh, build up their films. They really use their cameras as choreographers. They use their cameras as dancers that move around the characters in very long shots. Their mise-en-scene is extremely important. Um, and they move around their characters like their cameras are dancers. And I was like, wow, these brothers are using dance in their cinema. And I want to use dance in my cinema. I want to be able to use the thing that I never, that I quit doing because I felt uncomfortable doing it. I want to find a place for dance in my films. Um, and so I went looking for a way. I think I started seeing a lot of uh, modern dance spectacles. Um, and there's one choreographer very specifically that became very important to me which is called Jan Martens. And Jan Martens, I would call him a very cinematographic uh, choreographer that always builds up um, pieces around different relationships between people by just showing movements. He has a very famous piece called Victor, which is a dance performance between a grown man and a child. And the tension between the two of them changes from being um, a father and a child, two friends, two lovers. And the power of changing those tensions just by the way these people moved around each other or with each other made me see the power of visuals, made me see the power of movements, and made me see that as a filmmaker, I really wanted to base my films on movement rather than on dialogue. There's so many filmmakers that are so powerful in dialogue, and I can enjoy those films so much, but I knew that it's not my forte. When I start writing a dialogue, it feels not good. Um, 
it feels not like people talk to each other. I find people that write good dialogue, I have so much appreciation for them. It's like people that direct comedy. For me, they're the highest. I mean, they should be up here. Because people that direct comedy are extremely talented. Um, but so I discovered I really wanted to work with visuals. And I really wanted to work with movements. And in a way, Chantal Ackerman and Gus Van Sant were already examples of that. Because they are filmmakers in which movement is the central thing. Movement and sound. And sound has, got, has become a very important part in my films because I wanted to work with visuals, but I at the same time still wanted to make cinema. And so cinema is also supported by its sounds and its music. And I discovered that sounds can really add different layers to one visual. You can see a visual, but the sound that you add to it can shape completely a different world, can shape something completely different to that image. Um, and that same teacher that I was talking about, Martin, that became my mentor, um, she was a teacher in sound and music, and she really made me aware of the impact of sound and music on something. Um, she really made me see that if you add music, if you add sound, that you can create tension, that you can create emotion, that you can create so many different things. Um, when I made L'Infini, I really wanted to experiment with all that. I put visuals, I put storm sounds, I put music, I put everything. And in a way, it's an unfinished film. In a way, it's an experiment. And in a way, I like the fact that the title also is L'Infini, which means unfinished. Um, but the ground, the fundaments were there in that film of what Girl became. Because Girl is the first film that I made after school. I didn't continue after school to make short films because the idea of girl was already in my head. Actually, in 2009, when I was 18 and about to start film school and still not very honest with who I was, I discovered a story in a Belgian journal about a young 15-year-old trans girl called Nora who wanted to become a classical dancer, but whose school did not allow her to change classes from the boys' class to the girls' class. And I cut out that article immediately. I cut it out and I kept it with me. And I think my main reason why that article was so important to me is because this was a confrontation for me with a 15-year-old that was that shows the truest version of herself, that was extremely honest, that said what she wanted to do and showed her ambition. And in this article were all the elements of what I had been confronted with as a kid. A, there was the dancing that I had quit and that she continued to do. B, there was a confrontation between <clears throat> a man and a woman and gender and biology. And see, there was this theme of who am I, who do I want to be, and how do I get there, that I felt like was going to be important, well, that was important to me at the time, but was definitely going to be, <coughs> be important in my work. And so I kept it because I knew the moment that I quit film school, I want this to be my first film in the hope that at that moment in time, I will be able to be honest and make it. And so I... <coughs> and so I contacted her during film school and I said, 
I have such a big admiration for you. Would you like to meet me and see what we, what we can do? And she said she refused. <coughs> she refused because she was at a very difficult moment in her life, and because the media had been very eager to write about her story and about her school not accepting her to dance as a girl. And I was very sad that she refused, but I, but I said, okay. And the year after, I tried again. And my persistence, um, I think, made her want to meet me. <coughs> we met each other. And I said, I really want this to be my first film. I really want to write something about you. Um, and luckily, she agreed. Um, and we started talking about um, her life and about who, her wanting to become a classical dancer. And I think from talking a lot with her, I found out that although she had been very true to herself at a young age, although she had been very honest at a young age, she had come at a point in life where she wanted to disappear, where she wanted to fit in, where she definitely didn't want to stand out and not be the trans girl that is an example or the trans girl that is different. She wanted to be like the rest. And I recognized myself. I recognized me and what I had been trying to do to fit into a heteronormative society. She was trying to fit into a cis society. And I said, that's what I want the film to be about. I want the film to be about that moment in our lives where we rather want to fit in than stand out. And I knew in that moment that I had been living up to making that film for at that moment in time, 21 years. 21 years I had been living up to make a film about that subject. And so when people, in sometimes in interviews, people ask me now, as a cis director, can you talk about trans people? Can you talk about trans subjects? And I always, of course, answer to that in a polite way, because you get media trained to do so. But here I'll be more honest. And I'm always extremely upset when I get that question. Because, like, this film is about a very personal subject. And yes, this is a trans character, and yes, I am not trans. But we are both human beings that go through emotions, that go through phases in our lives, and we understand each other even if we are not exactly the same. And so for me, I have always seen cinema as a bridge. I make cinema because I want to have an effect on people, but I also make cinema for myself. And when I make it for myself, it's because I want to get to know someone and I want to understand other people better. And by doing so, I understand myself better. Cinema, and now I'm stealing words of Sebastian Lilio. This is a life lesson that doesn't come from me. Maybe it's the only life lesson you'll get. It's from a much adv more advanced director. Sebastian Lilio, talked about it as cinema should not be a wall. People ask me, can I make something as a cis straight man about a trans woman? I say yes. Yes, if I do it with respect. Yes, if I, if I put the work in. Yes, because I make cinema to try to get to know the world and let that world be seen by other people. And I feel exactly the same way. And that's also how I, how I feel about acting. Um, because Victor in this film plays a trans girl and he himself is a teenager. We all know that that's when you try to get to know who you are. But he doesn't identify as trans at the moment. And that sometimes has led to controversy, which has always really confused me. 
Because yes, we want to see trans talent on screen. Yes, we want to hear trans voices. That's one of the reasons we made this film. But we don't want to fight for inclusion by exclusion. We don't want to limit performers to their identities. We want to open up the barriers now that we're trying to open them up. We want to tear down the cages. And I think that um, when we see Victor's performance in Girl, we see that the biggest, that one of the biggest strengths for me on any artist is empathy and is trying to connect to the world and trying to connect to other people. <clears throat> okay. Uh, and so when I was writing Girl, um, the dialogues that I had between Nora and myself were at the base of the script. I didn't want to write alone. I didn't want to put myself through the solitude of writing alone. People that write alone, wow. You're like also heroes to me. I cannot write alone. For me, writing has to be a dialogue. Otherwise, if that, if that dialogue is interior, which it's also becomes sometimes, it's a very lonely place for me. So I hired, uh, or I worked with a screenwriter that is actually a theater maker called Angelo Tessis. He makes very funny theater. <coughs> he's much funnier than me. Um, and he's like a nice guy. And we both really wanted to talk about these subjects. Um, I felt that the first time writing, after I had done short films and really experimented with movement, and now all of a sudden we had to build this tension of a feature film. We had to engage people for an hour and a half or longer to stay watching that film. And that was like, in the beginning when we were writing, that was very tough because I was still conceptually writing my movements and my my dance things and and I wrote very conceptually and I thought maybe I can do like a Sven Sand and only write 13 pages and then film it. But people didn't really respond to my 13 pages and I had to find a way to write to understand the tension of a feature film. That's why I said I have to need more help. I'm gonna have to need more help than just one person. Um, and so I decided to do script workshops. I decided to have much more other people respond to what I wrote, see how they react, and let them teach me things that I don't know. Let them um, talk to me about scripts. And that's how I got ended up at Sous 2 in Norway, where I got to know Marion, and where I was confronted with many other filmmakers that all had very good ideas and we're all trying to write them out, trying to make them into a feature film. And you get a lot of reactions. You get a lot of people reading your stuff and reacting and thinking and, and that sometimes can be very confusing but it's also extremely helpful because you start to see which reactions come back and you start to see which reactions you resonate with and which you don't resonate with. And in a way, you, s you learn more about the film you want to make and m also more about the film you don't want to make. Because some people during the process, and I not only did Source 2, I also did Atelier Angers uh, from the Premier Plan Festival, and I also did Cine Fondation Residence from the Cannes Film Festival, which is actually a residence in which you get to stay six months in a ho in an apartment in Paris with five other filmmakers, and you get to talk a lot about films. I would also recommend. Um, you get to know really what you want your film to be. When I was writing Girl, and a lot of the times that I was talking to people, people told me. The father needs to be the main character. The father needs to be the main character because he is our way in. And I, for the longest time, I doubted whether there was truth in that. And maybe that would have been a great film. 
but it's not the film that I wanted to make. I didn't want to go through another character to arrive at our trans character. I wanted the trans character to be the lead and I wanted to, it to be about her. <coughs> and at, also at that time, there was not a lot of really concrete conflicts with the world around the trans character and people were wondering whether we didn't need more people that refused her, that didn't accept her, so that there would be <coughs> something for the audience to react to. And so all these things we felt like could be valid, but we also really reacted to them as that's not the film that we want to make. <coughs> we want to make a film in which the protagonist is her own antagonist, in which we see a trans character and we see the relationship that she has with herself, with her own self-image, and we use the ballet world as a metaphor for a much bigger society that thinks in a very binary way, that thinks in fairy tales, that thinks in roles for men and roles for women. And then we're confronted with this young trans character that is trying to find her way in that world. But all those people that you talk to that, don't, that disagree or that think differently are as valuable as the people that say to you, great idea. Because the people that don't necessarily agree teach you maybe sometimes even more for me than the people that agree. And actually that has been become very essential for me up until now. Because not everyone likes girl. People react to it sometimes in a very, very shocked, negative way. And I listen to those people just as much as I listen to the people who love girl. And it's not to torture myself, although making something and putting yourself in a very vulnerable place and then people destroying it is, in a way, destructive. But I feel like I'm, tr I'm able to see it as points that, made me s that make me learn more about my filmmaking and learn more about how I want to continue and learn more about the films that I really want to make. And so I feel that that is a very calming, comf comforting idea for myself. Because when there is criticism, I'm able to say to myself, I will use this. I will use this for me. And I will not, of course, it's, it's teary. In practice, you're always a little bit hurt and you want to shed a tear and call your mom. But I, I try to see it as something useful. So when um, I wrote Girl, and with all the script workshops that were very helpful, um, there was not a point at which I thought, this script is finished. And I feel like a script is never finished. It's not our end product. The end product is the film. And so although I really think a script needs time and needs the right shaping and needs tension and needs all those things, I also think that the pressure of making it perfect is sometimes what kills a film. I have a lot of friends around me that also make films that have been working on their scripts sometimes for a short time, sometimes for a much longer time and the tendency that I see is that when you work on something and continue and overwork it, that the script becomes too important. And although it has to be important, I think it also has to be a, seen as a tool. A tool which, which you go on set and then shape something completely there. Shape something new. Try to also allow yourself to let go of the scene that you wrote 
and see what is in front of you. See what works and doesn't work. And see life exist in front of your eyes. For me, it's the thing that excites me most about making a film. When I see my actors do something that I did not expect them to do. It is what excites me most because it's when I really get the feeling that, and this is a little bit um, maybe arrogant, but it, that I, I really get the feeling I'm creating. When they start having a life of their own, I really have the feeling that something is being created. Um, and so that is very e exciting to me. Um, this experience of making a first film, um, we, we spent four years active, really actively working on it. Um, film is something that is a teamwork. Film is, this film is, I get credited a lot because I go to places talking about this film, and yes, it came out of me, and yes, it's super personal, and yes, maybe I was at the steer, but film is a work of a team of people, of so many people. And this film is really, I recognize all the people that worked with me on this film, I recognize them in the film. My cameraman, Frank van den Eden, my editor, Alain de Sauvage, my first assistant, Sylvain van Dale. Everyone behind the scenes has an element in this film. And I think that was one of the biggest lessons for me as a first time filmmaker of a feature film is giving everyone the trust that they deserve. If you choose the people you work with, you also have to allow them to breathe and do their own things and have their element in the end product. I think because at the age of 12, I started to know that I wanted to make films, I had been living up to this moment and really wanted to control every single thing. Because I felt like, although my actors could do what they wanted, behind that I wanted to be in control and I wanted to act like I knew everything. But I know so little. That's also why I'm talking to you about my life. Because I know so little about really what it, what it takes to make a film. And I feel like that's not a bad thing. It's the fact that I don't know certain things is why I want to continue doing what I do, to get to know them. And it's exciting to get to know them. But so trusting all the members of a team that you work with to have their own elements, to have their elements in what you do, is a lesson that I had to learn by making this film. Because sometimes I feel like I try to control it too much. Um, and it could have been okay for me to also say, I don't know what to do with this now. Um, when there, Darren Aronofsky said this beautiful phrase, I think a film is never, you never finish a film, you abandon a film. And I feel that that is extremely true because um, you go through all these phases of making a film, writing it, shooting it, um, editing it, and you have the hope that at a certain point you will feel, yeah, it's, it's done. This is exactly what I wanted it to be. And I was waiting for that moment where I was going to be like, this is it. And that moment didn't really come because I felt like there was always something that could become more, that could continue. And I didn't feel that. And I watched if other directors felt that same way and that's how I discovered Darren Aronofsky talking about abandoning a film. And I felt like a, I abandoned girl. Um, and that felt strange in the beginning, but at a certain point it felt also liberating. Um, it felt liberating to abandon her. Um, often people say that the first, a lot of times the first film of a filmmaker, the first feature film, is really the film that they have been living up to for a long time of their life. So it's a lot of times a very important film in their life. And that's also why a first film, I have the feeling of a lot of directors that I know 
is one of my favorite films of them. Um, and I have the feeling that with Girl, that that is absolutely true. This is the film that I had been living up to, that I really wanted to make as a first film. I hope it will not be... <coughs> I hope my next one will be better, but I'm afraid of it. Well, afraid is a strong word. I, um, I have mixed feelings about it. Um, so yeah, that. Um, that's, I think, what I wanted to say. <laughs> Maybe I should talk about the music in this film. Who, has everyone seen Girl? Yes. Okay, that's nice. <clears throat> I have to talk to you about Valentin Hajaj, which is um, <coughs> my composer, and who I worked with for the first time on L'Infini, my last short film. Um, I got to know him at a festival in Aubagne, um, and someone said to me, That's, this guy is the new Mozart. And I was like, okay. And uh, I listened to what uh, Valentin was doing, and it was extremely, extremely powerful. And so we started to work on basis of the script of, of L'Infini. He started to make music on the basis of the script. And actually, it was so nice because before I created something, it's like Valentin tried to conc concrete, uh, concreticize. Is that a verb? We all understand what I mean. Concreticize um, my thoughts and my writing. And so it's like before I even started creating, Valentin created music. And that music, we played it on set, and I played it to my actors, and I played it to myself. And it was a very powerful thing because we felt like they were entering, he made us enter the atmosphere of the film. And when we, I, so I knew I wanted to collaborate with him on Girl as well. And he started writing music very early on during the first, second or third drafts of the scripts. Um, and when I talked to him, and actually when I talked to everyone, every single member of my team, I s always said, I want the film to be, to have a physical effect. I want the film to work physically. I want people that come to watch the film to have a physical experience. Um, and Valentin really, I think, understood what I wanted. And he went to listen to a lot of Arvo parts uh, with a lot of like sharp sounds, with a lot of violin, with violins, with a lot of um, yeah sharpness. And the first music he created was so extremely hard to listen to; it was like physical. Um, and then he continued on that path, and he really, I think, he is really to me a, a collaborator on the effect that I want to have with my films, because I feel like the music in um, Girl is really adding to the physical effect in the dance scenes or the physical effect that the film has. And this word physical has become very, very important to me. It was important actually in all my shorts. It was important in Girl, of course. And one thing I discovered after making three shorts and a feature is that there's one thing that is always coming back. And that is, and now, I, and it's, I think, I'm analyzing myself, of course, but with, the cam with my camera, I always seem to tend to try to touch the characters in front of me. Or I always seem to try to physically interact with people. And it's actually something that I didn't allow myself to do in real life for 22 years. For 22 years, I didn't allow myself to have a physical relationship with another human being. And I feel like in my work, that's what I'm trying to do. Not only on a mental level, trying to get to know people, trying to understand them, trying to reach out to them, but also very much on a physical level, I try to touch them. And I think that's why my camera has always been extremely close. My camera has always been 
really trying to focus on the body and is really trying to yeah be intimate when i was talking with girl about every member of my team i always said i wanted to be physical i wanted to work on the body and actually that is the continuation of my passion to become a dancer it's this passion for the very when you go to watch a dance performance it's a physical experience you have a lot of times you have bodies in front of you that interact there's this physicality and you react to it with your body with my films i want to have the same interaction with my audience um and in girl the dance is very literally present in the next one it will maybe more be more in a way like the brothers that then used it by using the camera as a choreographer around situations by trying to use movements by addressing it in a completely different way but what i do know is that yet again i think i will try to look for that physical experience um <laughs> i think that's what i wanted to say but maybe you guys have questions Lucas, uh, yes. I would suggest that the audience, um, sugiero que sea la audiencia porque ha estado estupenda. Um, yeah. Sí, si te hablo en español, uh, ha estado estupendo, pero yo creo que es la, el tiempo de la audiencia que haga preguntas porque verdaderamente, y es mi opinión, ha sido delicioso el análisis que has hecho de tu propio trabajo y tu evolución desde desde la persona hasta el filmmaker que eres ahora. Yo preferiría que fuera la audiencia que hiciera preguntas y si no, aquí el equipo, el equipo media tiene preguntas que hacerte. Adelante, compañeros. Sí. Uh, bonjour, Lucas. Uh, on peut se parler en francés. Oui. Ça va? Bueno, je m'appelle Oscar. Um, D'abord, bravo, parce que c'est magnifique, comme on vient de le dire. Tu te donnes, tu es, es d'une générosité très, très rare. Et en, te, en expliquant vraiment tout ton parcours, c'est vraiment très, très précieux pour nous tous ici de t'écouter. Et je voulais savoir, donc tu t'es montré, tu te, nous as parlé de tout ton côté artistique, mais financièrement, comment tu as obtenu des fonds pour faire ton premier long métrage, concrètement voilà. Ok. Merci. Yes. Um, <coughs> so, when I was um, doing my studies, I got to know another um, Flemish filmmaker who's called Felix van Groeningen, and he made a movie called Alabama Monroe, The Broken Circle Breakdown, Belgica, and he now made his first American film called Beautiful Boy with Timothy Chalamet you might know. Um, and I made the, uh, a lot of making off for his films and I also helped him cast his films. And he was one of the people that really taught me a lot about how to be on set. And through him, <coughs> through him I met a producer called Dirk Impens. Um, I met Dirk and we got along very well, and I pitched him the idea of girl. I told him about this article that I had found of a young trans girl called Nora, and how I really wanted this to be my first film. Um, and he resonated with that, and he said, "Look, I want to produce it. If you want to, if you want to make it, I want to do it." And I was surprised. And I was like, okay, yes, of course. Um, and it was before L'Infini was made. Um, but I knew that he wanted to do it with me. And I wrote a first treatment that he absolutely hated. Um, and so I thought, oh no, I'm going to lose him. Uh, so I kept 
really, I rewrote and I rewrote and it was before even there was another writer or... <coughs> and he still didn't like it, but he felt like I was really ready to invest what I had to invest. Um, and then L'Infini, uh, in, in Belgium we have a, f a very famous festival for short films called International Film Festival of Leuven. And L'Infini won the jury prize, which got me a little bit of visibility in the Belgian film sector. The film didn't really do well outside of Belgium. Festivals didn't really like the film. It, and the film is really an experiment, I must say. Um, but in Belgium, it got some visibility. And we handed in immediately that the, that film got the visibility. We handed in the treatment that was at the time Under My Skin. The project was called Under My Skin. And we got the money. Uh, we got uh, money to write, start writing this film. And Angelo came on board. We con continued to write. We went to Source 2. We went to... Um, Cine Fondation, and a year and a half later, we handed in the script, and they said yes. And so, a lot of the times in, in Belgium and probably in other countries, you hand in something and you get a no, and you have to re hand it in, get a no, you have to wait. And with this project, every time we handed it in, we got a yes, which is a very, we got a very luxurious position to be in. And in all my short films, I have always used French and Dutch. I really want to identify as a Belgian filmmaker much more than a Flemish filmmaker. Belgium is divided into two parts, a Flemish part and a French part. And I really want to be able to unify those two um, sides of, this, of the industry, those two sides of the country. I really want to unify them. And so the, the French-speaking part of Belgium really resonated with that and also immediately said yes. Um, and then we tried France, and France said no. Uh, and they regretted afterwards, <laughs> after this film went to Cannes. Um, <laughs> <coughs> but the Netherlands gave us some money. <coughs> and so... We didn't have, <clears throat> I mean, we had, we had, we made the film for 1.3 million euros. So we had enough. We didn't have <clears throat> cranes or, not that I would need them, my style is not very craney. But we didn't, we had the money to make this. We shot the film on 32 days. The first six days of the shoot, we did all the dance scenes, um, which were very intense because we had casted Victor, this young, uh, at the time, 15-year-old ballet dancer that had never danced on point shoes <clears throat> because he had always been training as a boy, never as a girl. So for the three months before the shoot, he had been training to do everything himself on points. But it was very demanding for his feet, very dangerous for his legs and his feet. And we had to really do it in the most responsible way. So to shoot all those scenes on six days, I mean, it was an intense first part of the shoot in which we were all really overwhelmed by everything that happened and we needed to do. But I must say that the financing of this film went extremely smoothly uh, for the budget that we had. Um, the only worries that there were sometimes was the combination of a first-time filmmaker and this subject. Because a lot of people had <coughs> really feared the subject, had the feeling that this subject was very delicate. And I mean, I have to say they were right, and they are right. This is a very difficult subject with a lot of <coughs> different opinions, a lot of, um, no, like depending also on the country you go to, we're now doing promotion in America with this film. I can tell you, it's a challenge. 
it's really something. But it's very interesting at the same time because it's films also that really continue conversation, that can spark dialogue that I think are important to continue building on what we call representation. And, um, and so, yeah, but the funding of this film, I must say, I, I'd like to say to you that it was very difficult and that I had to fight for every step of the way, but it was not at all like that. It was very, very easy. <coughs> Mas? Sí. Eh, felicidades por la película. Eh, como directora tuve una, una automutilación en un guión que me obligaron a rebajarla y quiero preguntar, porque me parece súper valiente que la mantengas, si siempre estuvo en el guión la automutilación de, de Víctor. Um, that's a very good question. Um, it was always in the script. Uh, it was always in the script because it was one of Nora's darkest thoughts. And when she told me that, I had uh, an extreme shock effect. I understood when she told me that the necessity of her to be in another body. And I felt like in the arc of the film, using the ballet as a metaphor for a society that is so binary and divided into male, female, and ballet also being this genre in which you have a lot of um, horror of the body, in which it's really about manipulation of the body, conforming the body to this perfect ideal of perfect form, to the most elegant feminine form, and this young character trying to find her way in that, representing something new, representing someone that is not, for whom it's not as easy, this division, I felt like it made a lot of sense, and I felt like it was the end point in an arc um, that we wanted to make. Um, but literally 90% of the people that I presented the script to that read this scene, absolutely hated it. Hated this scene, wanted it out, couldn't believe that I wrote that, had very, very extreme reactions to it. And I guess in the script phase, that convinced me even more that it was, the, that it was something that people reacted to, that was something that I needed to keep in. Now, um, looking back on it, because a lot of the times when people refuse, when a lot of people are very, think it's very, I mean, see that, the metaphor and everything, but sometimes people refuse to see the metaphors or the things, and then they only talk about the ending. And that is something that was predicted in the script phase. People said, people are only going to talk about the ending. You're going to lose so much of the subtleties because people are only going to talk about the ending. They were right. A lot of, I mean, not, I'm generalizing, not all the time, but a lot of the time people, because it's so impactful, talk about the ending. And I feel like with cinema, especially with cinema about minority groups, we are in such a specific time. We are in a time where political leaders refuse to see the existence of certain minority groups in this specific case, refuse, want to erase trans people, that we need art to be emancipatoric that we about these groups, that we need to see trans characters conquer, that we need to see them uh, shine, that we need to see them brave. And I also need that, but I also need to see these characters make mistakes. I also need them to see them in a human way. And I also 
needs, for me as a queer artist, thinks it's important to see those characters in difficult relationships with themselves and not only present them as fighters against the outside world. Yes, we need that. We need to see that. But I also need to see the other sides. And um, I really feel like now also presenting the film like it is and hearing a lot of reactions of, for example, trans kids and their parents, that I'm very happy that I kept it in. I'm very happy that I persisted, but it was the most difficult parts in the writing and in the making of this film to stand my grounds because I also, during the making, was really a lot of the times reflected with, am I, is this right? You know, even if I was convinced about a lot of the things, that was really something I was wondering, is this right? And that is, a, that is as making this film, it was like a dangerous, in a way, a dangerous thing. Because if it was not right, yeah, then we didn't have, then we lost a, a, a way of our story or we lost our arc. Um, and people disagree with me on that, but I feel like it's really where I wanted this film to go. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Um, watching the film, uh, I found myself like going through two movements. You know, sometimes I was very into Lara's story. I was just completely out of myself. And then I'll, the next moment I was really inside of myself thinking about my own awkwardness or insecurities and really re relating with the character, but just being reflected in myself. And I, I thought that was a beautiful balance that you found between, you know, having two lines, you know, a deeper uh, narrative about trans people and about, you know, if we accept them or not in our society and also a very like s material or concrete story about this character specifically, not about all trans people, but about Lara. Was that something that you were like, uh, you had principles where, when you were writing or with uh, the person that you were writing that you thought like, let's keep this balance? Or was it something that you found out in editing like um, that gave him that rhythm that kept at least myself, just going, you know, outside and inside of myself all the time and just feeling very affected by it and then just forgetting about myself and going into it. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. Um, I think, so first of all, I think what next to, of course, I talked about the personal attraction to Nora, but what as a filmmaker really attracted me was the combination of a young trans person <coughs> and the world of the ballet. The world of the ballet for me was why I didn't need in this film concrete antagonists. I didn't need the father to be non-accepting. I didn't need a family member to be difficult. I d didn't need all those things because the ballet world spoke about the bigger picture, spoke about the conflict, spoke about society and that division, that very binary world. So actually in that way, I could just have the character be in that world and that would say enough. Of course you need more things than that, but I felt like um, when I talked about Chantal Ackerman and showing a widowed woman in the 70s just peel potatoes, if you watch that film, you see her peel potatoes for 12 minutes and you're watching her. And I felt like with the script of Girl, we could re see rehearsals and Lara be in rehearsals and the repetition of that and that that would speak for itself. And so in a way I felt like when you see the dance scenes, you constantly see the same thing. I mean, it's not like there's a lot of differences in the dance scenes, it's a sort of mantra, it's a sort of repetition of her being there. Um, 
what was very clear for us in the writing is that we wanted this to be a portrait. And it's something that I repeat in the promotion also a lot because it's very important for me to say, this is the portrait of one trans girl. It's not a story about being transgender. It's a portrait on one trans girl. And so I wanted us as a spectator, my biggest wish was that we would enter her, that we would, that our eyes, the eyes of the people watching it would be her eyes. I mean, that was my wish for some people that went that way, for some people that didn't went that way. Um, but I really had the hope that we would experience the film as a in her body experience. Um, and I wanted to leave a lot of space for as, us as an audience to look at her. For example, look at her face, see her expression, try to interpret how she's feeling, try to be with her, and at the same time, not dictate as a filmmaker, this is what you should feel, this is what I'm saying, but leave that in a sort of open space so that you can project as an audience member. I think why this film, and that's my interpretation, why a lot of people resonate with it, is because as a person, I think you're able to watch a relationship with a body. And I think all of us, we have, of course, all of us, we have a relationship with our body. But for a lot of us, it's a very complex one. And I think if the film channels into that relationship with oneself and with trying to be yourself and with being a teenager, which for a lot of people is a period in, a, in their lives that they were in. Um, and I feel like there's a, um, or that was my hope, that there was a universality to this character that a lot of people would be able to enter her. Um, when I think about showing uh, queer characters, I try to think of it as, for example, how for me Barry Jenkins shows black characters. He shows them in, like, I don't know if you saw his new film, If Beale Streets Could Talk, but he takes this American Hollywood genre and he puts two black protagonists. And we would have, it's a film that we would have seen before with two white protagonists. Barry Jenkins takes it out of the niche and he makes it into the for everyone. And I feel like that's what I want to do with um, queer characters. And it's at the same time, it's something that people blame me. Because a lot of the, it's a lot of the times, or, or sometimes when you hear a trans person talk about the film, so, some love it, some don't. And when they talk about it, don't, they say, this is a film made for cis people. Because they say it's a film made for um, a wider audience to understand this this um, this issue, and I I disagree. This is a film made for the widest possible audience as possible, whether trans or human. I always go to look in my characters for that what connects us, so that my audience can connect with them. I never try to look for what makes them specific. I mean, this is a specific character, but I try to look for those things that make it resonate with me and resonate with all of us. And so that's why I hope that as an audience member, you're sometimes with her on this journey and sometimes you're with yourself thinking about a part of who you are and, and where you're at. Sí, al final. Al final. Hello, Lucas. First of all, thanks for coming here, for talking to us. Hello. It's, it's been very interesting, everything you said. Um, I'm kind of interested in the way you as a director project, project yourself in your films, because sometimes I feel like there is a kind of a conflict there, like uh, being honest and um, making an autobiography. So do you think it's possible to, to make a honest fiction without talking about yourself? There's a, <coughs> there's this thing. I never ever have had the need to make an autobiography. 
I've never wanted to make a film about a moment in my life. Some people maybe do, I've never had that. On the other hand, my films are extremely personal. And I don't think you can make something and not have it be extremely personal unless you do uh, a film as a, a um, for for a studio that you directed as like a, a how do you say it? I'm losing the English word for that but like you understand what I mean if you write something and you direct it and it comes out of you it's extremely personal I can and I'm too close I I don't watch the film anymore I've watched it once in Cannes and ever since I've not seen it anymore I will look at it probably in a year or so. But I know how personal this film is. I know how much of myself in, is in it, and that's quite a lot. Um, and I think, for example, when I was talking to you about the things that were important in, when I was young, um, the dance, the masculinity, fem masculinity, femininity, the roles, the behavior, um, but also very much the relationship with my body. I had a very complex relationship with my body as a teenager. Um, and I, I had, I, I would say I had a lot of, it sounds heavy, I had a lot of suffering. And I think I put that in this movie. And in a way now it's out of my system. I mean, I, I, this film was not only something for an audience, it was very much something for me. And I've always, the first, the main reason why I make films is for me, uh, not for you. Um, although I hope they are something for you, but I make them for me because I make them to process something out of my life. And in a way, this film was also a way for Nora to process that part of her life. Um, so for the two of us, it's a time document. Um, and that's a luxury to be able to do that. I'm in a very luxurious place where I get to do therapy while also doing my profession. So, um, yeah. Enhorabuena, ha sido un gustazo escucharte y un aprendizaje esta hora y media. Así. Gracias, ha sido un gusto y un aprendizaje escucharte. Quiero compartirte algo importante, creo que para mí y creo que también para ti. En el año 92 leí una tesis doctoral sobre transexualismo en España, en la universidad, en el año 92. La empecé a hacer en el año 82 sobre androginia. Androginia. Y terminó siendo sobre transexualismo. La empecé a hacer porque durante mi vida... Mi madre reproducía lo que la sociedad entendía por lo masculino y mi padre reproducía lo que la sociedad entendía por lo femenino, hablando psicológica, anímicamente. Fue una búsqueda personal como socióloga que me llevó a viajar de la androginia a la transexualidad, buscando espacios de libertad. Eh, en el año 92 salió un artículo que se llamaba «El transexualismo como síndrome cultural» la pasión por la identidad. Fue tanto el eco que tuvo por las fechas que eran en España que el movimiento transexual mmm, cogió mucho ese artículo. Pero yo no quería ni defender ni atacar el movimiento trans. Quería simplemente reconocer su lucha, pero como una metáfora de un proceso humano de búsqueda de identidad. De hecho, me apasionaban ellos porque con libertad reproducían a gran escala la búsqueda de lo que es la identidad humana y el papel que el género y el sexo juegan en ella. Cuando vi que se me quería reducir, me alejé y dejé y me, me dediqué a otras cosas que tienen que ver con algo que he visto en tu película y termino. Y te quiero felicitar por ello porque he visto después de muchos años en una película recuperado algo que yo intenté hacer, eh, que era la atracción que tiene para todo ser humano occidental que vivimos esclavos de la división entre la conciencia corporal y la mente, el cuerpo y la mente. Y en tu película, por fin vi 
más allá de que estuviera documentado en un caso biográfico concreto, el anhelo de mostrar algo que trasciende, algo trans sobre el mundo trans y que nos afecta a todos. Y es la pérdida de la conciencia corporal, la castración del cuerpo como forma de relacionarte con la vida. Así que, enhorabuena, tu película es compleja, abierta, matizada, tiene mil lecturas y después de casualmente estar aquí porque soy una infiltrada y de escucharte una hora y media, te digo enormemente de mi corazón, enhorabuena, has creado algo que durante muchos años podrá tener muchas y muchas miradas porque has tocado un núcleo muy importante. Te agradecemos tu intervención y yo creo que es el momento de poner lo que so much, el broche uh, de oro. Please, please go ahead. Do, I don't want to interrupt you. I'm very sorry. Go ahead. I just wanted to thank her because she said beautiful things. Yeah, this is what I was going to say is because we 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 try to short up the the session and uh, we think it's a good idea to close with the final question that because I was trying to pick up a conclusion that you said on beautiful words that uh, are summarizing your work, like uh, being a team player, being physical, I'm taking words that are in your, being honest, being script is just a tool, but it's something more organic that go behind. Um, movement as a dialogue continually, so you, you like choreography, so I'm trying to get magical words that are in your beautiful speech about transmission, about all what you learn from other directors. And you mentioned um, from uh, Chantal Ackerman that unfortunately she left us. And of course, uh, Darren Aronofsky. And uh, of course, the, the, the slasher coming from Scream as one of your movies. And I was thinking, it's no time to make the question, but how like Luca Guadagino make a dialogue with the Rio Argento, with Suspiria, would you love, it's a, it's a potential question, to do a kind of a dialogue for a Tenebrae, for whatever movie comes up using dancing? That's a question, later on. But following with that, my question to find, make the final thing, because you mentioned that, that you are doing the movies for you and you don't want to build walls about what you need to learn from the world. It's because Darren Aronofsky said it's an abandoned film. You see yourself some years in the future, because it's about something personal as well, as you mentioned, revisiting the character with Victor or with another actor, 10 years in time about what happened to Lara after that not so-called happy end, searching for identity. That's what's trying to close and putting all the things for the audience. Super, nice, well done. You closed it. Um, would I revision, um, would I go back to Lara? Um, no, I would not. I would not because she has been very close to my heart and I'm grieving the fact that I let go of her. She has been in my mind for nine years, but I'm also very happy to let go of her. Uh, she takes, she, she's extremely important to me and will always be, and this film will always be crucial in my life, but I don't think I would ever revisit it. Um, for me, the film very much is what I wanted to say about this, and I'm really looking forward to continuing with another character and with another part of me and with another part of my life. And this is a time document, like I said. For me, it's something that I can place now, and now I want to move forward. Um, unless in 10 years, I don't have anything to talk about anymore, and people ask me to do a sequel, and they pay me a lot of money, <laughs> I will, of course. Um, then, that dialogue with the with other films. Luca is one of my, I think Luca is such a, I, I can, I don't know if I can call him Luca, but his last name is just too difficult, I'm sorry. Guarnino, is that right? Yeah. He is, I think he's extremely talented and he is someone that really does 
film one film at a time if you look at call me by your name and then you look at suspiria after i think he's challenging himself i think he's um really diving into different worlds diving into old making it new diving into different subjects <coughs> and that is something that would definitely interest me um i don't know if i would do a remake of a of a horror film but it is an interesting idea i think for now because I said earlier, what in a way, and in a way, I don't know if that's a selfish thing. It maybe is, but I'm really interested in creating and bringing to life things that come out of my mind. And for now, I feel like that is what I am wanting to do. But then maybe when I come at a point where my mind is like, don't know what to create anymore, then I would revisit something else. Thank you. Thank you everyone for listening to me. I hope it was some inspiration at some point. And uh, have fun in Sevilla. <laughs> Thank you.